Well, hello there, my YouTube gang. What's up? It's Johnny Varsity again. So, you know these people who say that the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God? You know, people like Kent Hovind, who say that evolution is so stupid. Well, today, we're gonna deal with them. But first, the disclaimer, and this time, please read it. Okay, so first, the basics. For biological evolution to occur, you need three properties and one force. The properties are multiplication, heritability, and variation. And the force acting upon them, selection, whether natural or not. Hey, looks like a vector, right? Well, you can actually think of evolution as working in four vectors genetic epigenetic behavioral and mimetic and these vectors are not only interdependent they actually work on all levels of the biosphere which in turn influence one another and are influenced by external factors of the ecosystem and this video will be more about this the rest will be covered in my next video and now let's dispel the first myth. The DNA in your nucleus isn't the only genetic information passed on through generations. You have a multitude of non-nuclear genetic information, mostly stuff floating around in your cytoplasm, like the DNA in the mitochondria, or if you're a plant, the DNA in the chloroplast. And you've got all sorts of other bits and pieces that replicates independently of the chromosomes. But it turns out the DNA isn't only passed down vertically, it actually passes horizontally too. Actually, one of the best proofs we have for evolution are what can be called genetic fossils. For instance, retroviruses that at some point in the past invaded a reproductive cell of a species, left their DNA there, and that DNA was later passed on to progenies. And the genetic imprints that they left help us, for instance, figure out where common ancestry splits. So when Kent says this, I found this bone in the dirt. This is the ancestor of all the humans today. You don't know that that's the ancestor of anybody. You can tell him that some fossils are actually alive and well and harboring his DNA as we speak. And by the way, not all of this virus DNA is junk DNA. Actually, some of the endogenous retrovirus DNA codes for protein. So when Nephilim says that evolution would in fact require a continuous input of new genetic information. He's actually kind of right. And when Kent says that no new information is ever added, he's wrong enough to go to those goddamn viruses and explain to them that God made them right and you're messing them up. Now leave them alone, all right? Now, creationists would have you believe that both creation and evolution are inherently religious. Forgetting that scientific theories are all about predictions that come true, while religious predictions don't have have the same level of success. And one prediction of evolution theory is that if variation is such a key component of evolution, the more sophisticated the organism, the more control it will have over the variation and its causes. And they do. Now, Kent thinks that natural selection doesn't cause any evolution. And yet, the evolution of male-female reproduction was actually evolved as an evolutionary driver, creating genetic variation, which also dispels the great myth that the Darwinian idea was that things look designed, but they're not really designed because there's an undirected process, namely natural selection acting on random mutations. Wrong. It acts on variations, a small proportion of which is caused by random mutations, which, as you'll see, are not exactly random, at least not in frequency. You see, as most creationists will tell you, random mutations cause damage to genetic information. Which is true in most cases, although when they say something like this... You know why nobody's ever shown a good mutation? 
because nobody's ever seen a good mutation. They kind of forget that we are all eating crops that farmers wanted to improve, but due to lack of genetic variation, had to induce mutations by radiating DNA, causing mutations, and then selecting the desired mutants out of the results, kind of mimicking what is happening in nature. Now, in nature, when organisms require variation in order to survive changes in the environment, like food shortage, they don't wait for farmers and their radiation. They actually self-induce rapid directed mutations. Why? Well, during stress periods like starvation, the more mutated progenies, the more variation. And the more variation, the more natural selection has to choose from. And along with other mechanisms, self-induced rapid mutation actually dispels another myth that organisms slowly evolved into everything we see today. Which of course would demand every organism to leave behind a fossil trail of very granular transitional form. You know, creatures that are half one animal and half another. Actually creationists might also mention and the Cambrian explosion that there is a huge explosion of diversity happening within species in a very short geological time. Which proves what we already know. Evolution doesn't have to be gradual or slow. Actually, some say that gradual and slow evolution is an exception to the rule. But evolution isn't just about making stuff like bones and wings appear. It's also about making stuff this appear. Now, Kent, for instance, thinks that... Genetic information was lost when you got your variation. It wasn't added. But, you see, genes of traits that were valuable in the past are rarely entirely lost. Usually what happens is that the genes get switched off or change roles giving selection the ability to switch them back on if necessary. And I admit I couldn't believe my good luck when Kent said this. There's only about a zillion differences between a reptile and a bird. Because here is a reptile, and here is a bird, and here is a chicken embryo beak, and here is an embryo alligator snout. Oh, no, it's not an alligator snout. It's actually a chicken's beak, which dormant genes were switched on, and it suddenly grew alligator-type teeth, proving to us that both alligators and chickens have a common ancestor. So either the common ancestor left his genes there, which were then switched off in the chicken, or maybe it's just one of those times where God decided to change his mind midway. You know... And at the end of the day, for Kent and his friends, it all comes down to this. We're hurtling through space around the sun right now at 66,000 miles an hour, and nobody's in charge. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Although I, for one, would be more frightened if the god that inspired these books was in charge. And now, sub me so you can see the next video about the other three things and also friend me on Facebook. So, like always, my beloved YouTube gang, peace, love, harmony, have a good one, people, I love you all, yeah!